right, everybody. Um, happy Monday, and welcome back to an OpenShift Commons briefing. Today, we are going to talk about Metal Cubed, or Metal 3, or whatever we want to call it, um, but I like Metal Cubed the best, and um, it's a new CNCF project. Uh, we have two uh, folks here from Ericsson, who are maintainers on the project, Mal and Farazan, who I'm going to let introduce themselves. Um, we'll have live Q&A at the end, so wherever you are listening, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch, um, ask your questions there or here in BlueJeans, and we will relay them to the guest speakers. Um, and then at the end of the demo and the wonderfulness of Metal Cubed, um, we'll just have a conversation. So, um, Farouz, take it away. <clears throat> Hello. Um, thanks a lot. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for having us today here and giving us a chance to share <clears throat> with you a project that we've been working on. So we are really, really happy to be here. Um, and today we'll be talking to you about a quite a young project called uh, Metal Cube, which which does basically provisioning um, for the bare metal host uh, for the bare metal host in the Kubernetes cluster. So shortly, who we are? My name is Firuz Jumiyasarv. I am I'm working at Ericsson as an experience developer, and I'm one of the MetalCube project maintainers. Oops. Mile? Thank you. Yeah, sorry, like mishap with the mic. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying that my name is also, like, so my name is Melky Mala, and I'm also working at Ericsson, um, and I'm also a MetalCube maintainer. <laughs> cool. Thank you. So, what is Metal Cube? What problems does it solve, and what does it really offer to you? So, first of all, it's a CNCF project, a sandbox project. In fact, it's a quite uh, young project, as I already mentioned it. And the interest to the project has been increasing so far quite a lot, and the community always keeps basically growing. And we're seeing more and more people joining our community, doing all sorts of contribution, which is really, really amazing. So it's a bare metal host provisioning tool that basically allows you to manage your um, uh, bare metal nodes through the Kubernetes native APIs. Um, there are different ways and already existing tools that you can use to manage the bare metal infrastructure or the host. But primary goal, primary goal of the Metal Cube was to use uh, to have the Kubernetes native APIs in order to do the management management of the bare metal hosts. So the second, it's uh, self-hosted, uh, meaning that all the building components, all the building blocks, and the controllers that MetalCube offers to you run inside of your Kubernetes cluster, uh, which basically eliminates the the need to have some extra tooling to manage the MetalCube project itself. Um, also, MetalCube uh, offers a plugin for the Kubernetes uh, sub-project called Cluster API, um, which is the C cluster lifecycle. Um, and uh, we will talk a bit more about the cluster API in the upcoming um, slides. So now let's see what is MetalCube stack and what does it really represent for us. So let's see the high level picture uh, of what would you get from the MetalCube. So imagine that you have the infrastructure or the bare metal infrastructure that you want to manage and the MetalCube has a component called cluster, uh, sorry, uh, the bare metal operator that um, basically takes care of uh, provisioning and then deprovisioning of your bare metal hosts. So one thing to note in here that uh, uh, metal cube uh, or the bare metal operator under the hood is using uh, ironic tool, which is from the uh, OpenStack ironic community. Um, but it's also important to know that uh, we're not shipping any other um, services or the parts of the OpenStack because we're running Ironic as a standalone tool, uh, meaning that um, it's it's really um, under the hood. When, when bare metal operator is using the under the hood, the, BM, uh, the Ironic, it's somehow uh, hidden from the picture. So and the bare metal operator always uh, takes care of. Uh, managing the ironic itself, so you don't have to do the management of the ironic because MetalCube will do it for you. Um, yeah, and also the next component in the in the in the MetalCube stack is called Cluster API Provider MetalCube, which is also another big component that MetalCube offers. But before we jump into it, I would like to mention that bare metal operator can be used separately. You don't have to use any other components of the MetalCube to do the management because uh, the main component is, let's say, bare metal operator. 
But if you want to integrate your uh, cluster management, specifically bare metal cluster management, uh, with the other projects like Cluster API, then you have to use the Cluster API provider MetalCube, which is basically the plugin that you can use uh, in order to plug your uh, management into the Cluster API project. So both bare metal operator and then the Cluster API MetalCube, they run uh, inside the Kubernetes cluster. So uh, which would be, in this case, which would be really, really easy to manage them. And you don't have to, as I already said, you don't have to have some extra tooling or um, components to manage these, uh, the clusters. Um, and then the last component in the stack is the cluster API. Uh, so the cluster API is the high level project in the stack, let's say that offers some uh, machine objects and then uh, cluster objects. Uh, and then those objects are uh, represented by different infrastructure provider in different ways. But in our case, for example, if you create the machine object, the cluster API, which at the end of the day represents your Kubernetes node, that machine object would, for example, if you say create one machine object from the cluster API, at the end of the day, it will create the bare metal server through the cluster API provider metal cube, and then later through the bare metal operator. And then you will have basically bare metal server that is managed by the high level object, like a machine from the cluster API. Great. Um, so, so quick overview of the cluster API uh, before we dive into the MetalCube project. Cluster API is a, um, is a Kubernetes sub project focused on the cluster lifecycle management and it allows you basically the day two operations or the manage your cluster uh, in most of the cloud environments or in most of the cloud providers. Um, and then whenever you do the management, you do it in a declarative way, right? So you do you use the um, Kubernetes native APIs um, or you use the Kubernetes manifest. So in short, you will be able to deploy and uh, and manage your Kubernetes cluster where the we are the Kubernetes. So that means all the components and then the the, the building blocks of your cluster API, uh, all the controllers are running inside the Kubernetes cluster. And then those controllers actually manage your target clusters, which are running somewhere in the cloud, for example, or in the in the um, bare metal infrastructure. So as such, we always need a cluster to start with cluster API. So we create a management cluster, which is also uh, known as a bootstrap cluster or the ephemeral cluster, which you see on the left side of the slide. Um, and then in that ephemeral, ephemeral cluster, we start installing all the cluster API components uh, and then the controllers. And once you have a bootstrap cluster up and running with all the cluster API components and all the necessary controllers, then you can start actually creating your target cluster uh, in your desired cloud environment, whether it's uh, GCP or AWS or Azure or DigitalOcean whatsoever. So uh, what we did also, we, what we did with MetalCube is that we somehow extended the list of the infrastructure providers by adding the uh, cluster API infrastructure provider for bare metal. So MetalCube, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, allows you to do the cluster management or the bare metal host management for in the in the real bare metal servers uh, or in the real bare metal infrastructure. So we basically added one of the infra providers for the list of the cluster APIs, infrastructure providers. So uh, now let's see uh, how the objects are referenced, uh, referenced from one ob uh, project into different uh, into another project. So imagine you have the Kubernetes node object um, that is like the core component of the core object in from the Kubernetes. So um, once you create or once you create a, when you want to create the Kubernetes node. So you can use, for example, Cluster API to 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 define from where that uh, actual node should be created, like a virtual machine or the actual bare metal server. So uh, the node is uh, transformed into the machine object, which is coming from the Cluster API project. So uh, which is kind of the generic across all the infrastructure providers. But uh, once you create the machine object from the Cluster API, then you have to tell in which infrastructure do you want to actually create the machine? For example, you can say that I want to create the machine uh, or the virtual machine in AWS, or I want to create a machine on the Google Cloud, or I want to create the real bare metal server that would represent my machine, and that will be uh, basically uh, represent the Kubernetes node, right? So once you have 
uh, define it from where you want to, from which infrastructure you want to create your machine, then you will have the actual cloud infrastructure that will be taking care of creating virtual machines in the cloud uh, for the cloud providers or the actual bare metal server for the metal queue, for example. So what happens is that in most of the cloud providers, uh, the process will end up in in, in the in the cloud uh, infrastructure itself. So the, all the cloud providers have already have uh, their APIs to manage their underlying infrastructure. Uh, but in our case, since we're doing the uh, the bare metal node, bare metal host management, we we didn't have any cloud provider behind, and we had to create our own APIs that will actually do the uh, the management of the real or, uh, servers or the physical machines. So for that, we have created the bare metal operator, as I already mentioned a bit, so which actually does the, the management of the underlying infrastructure or your bare metal servers. Um, and then at the end of the day, it will basically talking to your, um, uh, the, the bare metal server. So you can see that from the left, uh, whenever it's moving from the left to the right, um, we have the node object that is referenced by the machine, and that machine is referenced by the infrastructure specific machine, uh, in our case, metal cube machine. And then we talk to bare metal operator and then ask, hey, I want to create a one server in this data center, please go ahead and do this, right? So instead of having some uh, APIs like uh, any other cloud providers. Yep. So the next thing is the metal cube custom resource definitions and then the CRDs, and I will leave this part to Mile. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so let's dive a bit deeper in the in the technical details of the um, of the metal cube project. So we're going to start uh, with this kind of like overview of the different elements that uh, that we have and how they work. How they work together. So you've already heard like all these kind of terms like the metal operator, the, met, the provider metal cube for cluster API, cluster API itself. So basically for, for all of those there's like um, there's a, like, objects representing like real um, uh, real items like for example we have a cluster object that represents the, the Kubernetes cluster and with its like equivalent for the provider that is here the metal cube cluster. Um, same way we have the machine that represents the, um, the Kubernetes node and the metal cube machine that is the infrastructure provider equivalent for that machine. Um, so all, all of those are basically referring to each other. Um, the, like for, for example, the cluster um, points to the metal cube cluster, like telling cluster API how to actually like deploy that cluster like with the infrastructure provider. And the machine points to the metal cube machine, like telling exactly how to deploy um, deploy that Kubernetes node. In addition, as Ferro said, there's the bare metal host that um, is all referenced directly from the metal cube machine um, to tell like um, that you want to deploy this Kubernetes node on this specific hardware. So the different controllers are represented in the, in this picture, um, and they interact each with their own. Um, on objects, and there's usually a dedicated controller for each of the each of the objects. Um, the controller might be like editing some other objects as needed to uh, fulfill its role. So that is the high-level view of the different CRDs that we have in the in the Metal Cube project. Uh, now we're going to like dive in, like have a look. Specifically at each of the um, each of the metal cube like CRDs that we have. So the first one is the metal cube cluster. Um, it's it actually consists um, like with the like usual elements of a, of a CR of a CR. Um, the interesting part for us is in the spec. So we have a definition of the of the uh, control plane endpoint that represents the the Kubernetes endpoint for your cluster, so the load balancer endpoint. It needs to be defined um, beforehand because in the case of um, in bare metal infrastructure, we are not in a cloud provider environment where we have just like load balancers that we can create. Um, unfortunately, we have to um, ha handle it uh, as part of the deployment. So you need to give it beforehand telling like this will be the, the endpoint of the cluster. So um, that is the metal cube cluster. Then the next item was the metal cube machine. So this defines like 
gives more detail about like how the um, how the Kubernetes node would be deployed. So the kind is Metal Cube Machine, and if we have a look at the spec, we have the the first um, thing is the image reference. So here you give a URL to an um, an image, like a QCAR to image, for example, and the checksum uh, of that image, so that um, Ironic can deploy the node with that specific image. There's also a host selector that allows you to choose which of the bare metal hosts you want to deploy on. And then you have a um, couple of other available fields like um, data template, for example, that allows you to, to pass templates for the metadata that will be included in the user data or for the network uh, configuration that will also be applied by Ironic through CloudInit. You can, of course, you don't have to use templates for that. If you want to directly give the metadata or the network data, you can also do it directly via, via the um, metadata and network data fields. So this uh, basically allows you to um, configure uh, in, in quite fine-grained uh, level of details the um, deployment of the Kubernetes node that you will, you will have. It's, it doesn't touch anything um, to, with regard to Kubernetes itself, it's, it's more like if you want to do some customizations on your, on your node or like if you want to change something, deploy a specific image and all of this is in uh, this specific object. The next object that we're going to have a look is at is the bare metal host. So the bare metal host uh, represents the physical server. So the, in the spec here, um, we will have all the details that are needed to be able to access that server, like control it and manage it, or ironic to work with it. So um, the first very important one is the BMC. So that's where you will have the, the details of the, of the uh, management um, interface of that node. So you can have either like, well, in that case, libvirt uh, when you're using some virtualization, but if you're using an actual server, you would probably have something like Redfish or IPMI or ILO, like depending on what you're, what you're using. So um, a lot of protocols are supported. Uh, that's like thanks to using Ironic, that is a quite an, an um, um, that is a project that is supporting a lot of, a lot of, a lot of different protocols. Um, the addition uh, that you have to give here in, in the in the specs is the boot MAC address because Ironic needs to identify the node when it boots. So the way to do that is to tell which uh, is the expected MAC address for that node when it boots so that like Ironic can figure out that, hmm, okay, that node is booting and it's this, I, I know that it will be like this bare metal host. So um, that's how it's basically matched. And then again, you, you can give the image uh, the URL to the image and the checksum, and then the user data if you have any that you want to to be given uh, through um, cloud for cloud in it uh, run. So this is basically the the three core um, CRDs that we have in the MetalCube project. Um, we are not going to go through the CAPI one because there are there are already like a lot of uh, available webinars and um, other things related to this. So um, we can give you some references if you want. Um, let's keep instead like uh, diving deeper into, into MetalCube and how things are actually working here. So um, in the next slide, um, we are going to be talking about the bare metal operator and how um, it manages the node. So the bare metal operator itself is, is a controller that interacts with the, the CR, um, the bare metal host CRs, and it can do a couple of operations. So the first one would be to inspect the hardware. It's able to like boot the node and then um, run something that is called ironic Python agent that will like go through all the specs of the of the hardware and report it to um, to Ironic, and bare metal operator will be able to fetch that data. So at the end of the inspection, you will have, for example, the NICs, um, the dri hard drives, the CPU, um, the firmware, like a lot of different elements that are available for you to um, to fetch from the bare metal host CR. The second operation that uh, bare metal operator can do is to provision a host. So you can give it the image and then it will take care of making sure that Ironic will write that image to disk and reboot your server to boot that specific image. The third operation that a uh, bare metal operator can do for you is to clean the disk and that usually happens during the provisioning and deprovisioning um, of the of the bare metal operator. 
there's then the like a couple of um, let's say um, useful um, cap capabilities of parameter operator. It can of course like manage the power of your node. So like um, if if you need to reboot it to power it on, power it off, like you can do it through the CRs, just ed editing the parameter host CRs. So um let's like talk a bit more maybe like in in more fine details uh, about the um, the vermetal operator and the ironic interaction so the vermetal host the the cr itself uh, points also to a couple of secrets and th those secrets contain the user data and uh, the metadata for example and the network data all those are um for uh, cloud init and when you give it um you can give it as um, as different elements, but at the end they will be combined into um, a config drive. And so Ironix takes care of this, and then uh, when Bemeter operator in, uh, instructs Ironix to, to start the deployment, then Ironix will start talking to the BMC to turn on um, the server, and then the um, the, the server um, will boot the Ironix Python agent. Ironic will then directly talk with the uh, with the Python agent um, that is here called deploy RAM disk and ask it to basically download the image from um, whatever web server where it is stored and write it to the disk. So that's like to the local disk. In addition to this image, it will also uh, write the config drive on a specific uh, part of the part of the hard drive and then once that is done it will just instruct the server to reboot from the hard drive and then it will boot into the image that you asked so that's how the magic happens um, now like if we want to go even deeper in the details uh, we can like see how this happens under the hood so when basically when Diameter operator um, registers the node. What OpenStack uh, Ironic does under the hood is that it goes to talk to the BMC to turn on the server. The server will send a DHCP query when booting because it tries to boot over PXE. The um, DNS mask um, that is in that case uh, with the role of DHCP server will answer and in the DHCP reply give all the details about the image that um, the server needs to download to boot uh, from PXE, and that, it that would be EPA. The um, server will then proceed with introspection on the first, the first time the, the first time the, the server starts with EPA, it will always do the introspection and then um, send the report to Ironic. That parameter operator will then be able to fetch directly from, from Ironic. And once the node is introspected, then you have it ready and you can start like, provisioning a node and like deploying something on top. So the, for the provisioning, um, so same thing, the metal operator will start talking with Ironic and Ironic um, will like boot the IPA again on the server and then instruct it to deploy the node. So the IPA in that case will download the image from HTTPD, write it to the disk. So the thing is, if you're downloading the image like in a, uh, in some specific formats like QCAR2, um, they will need to be uncompressed and like um, adapted. But basically, at the end, it will write the raw image to the disk. Once it's ready, it will send a signal to Ironic that will then trigger a reboot, and Bermuda operator will then update the status and say like, "Hey, there you go. Your node is ready. You have it provisioned." So yeah, that's it for the provisioning. Um, now, if we talk a bit about the integration of the cluster API provider, MetalCube, and the different functionalities that this handles, um, we have the, the following. So um, this is really the, the integration with um, cluster API that um, the, the MetalCube object, like MetalCube cluster and MetalCube machine, are actually interacted with uh, the cluster API um, controllers. So we have the different elements like MetalCube cluster, MetalCube machine, um, but there's also like additional ones that we didn't uh, go too much into details, like the machine template that allows cluster API to generate MetalCube machine uh, based on this. Like you can uh, think about it like maybe um, for a deployment, the spec part of a deployment that is then translated into actual pods um, or like some data template that would be from which you can generate the user data um, and like including also the network data for the for the node. So um, all of this 
are like linked to um, cluster API provider metal cube and the result is a single like cloud init file um, that is then handled as a user data and passed to bare metal operator that then forwards it through ironic uh, onto the config drive on the node and then cloud when cloud init starts it will find this um, cloud cloud config and run with it deploying your kubernetes node and have it getting it ready and then once it's boots once it boots it will join the kubernetes cluster or like if it's a control plane then it might start with just a kubeadm in it and then the f further on the next control planes will join and then the workers that are all deployed through this process so um that's Enough, I think, like uh, details right now. Um, I will give it back to Ferus for uh, presenting the demo of all all this that we just uh, talked about. Can, can we pause just for a quick question? Because um, Peter asked a question um, about uh, back around the provisioning. So before we go into the demo, and he, what he asked was, does the image get expanded to fill the hard drives um, on the server when you install, or do you need to specify a specific layout, et cetera? Um, so the expansion happens later when the when the server actually boots the image. That's usually at that time. But uh, of course you have like the the specific um, size of the image will be written to the disk. So like let's say you have um, a raw image that is actually 10 gigabyte, you will have those 10 gigabyte on the on the hard drive. But your hard drive might be like I don't know like 500. So um, you of course will get it expanded when you boot the actual node. And that's part of the actual um, image, like um, this mechanism. Okay, so he's asking a little bit of a follow-up question too. If you have multiple disks, et cetera, how do you manage, customize the image location, boot configuration, et cetera? Or are you gonna demo that for us now? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I don't think it's part of the demo. Um, so the way to do this um, is actually an ironic mechanism. They call it root device hint. And the root device hint allows you to specify some identifier for the disks that you want to deploy on. So you could say, for example, um, I want a disk that has this WWN to um, deploy to write the image on, or you could say like any disk that is over 500 gigabyte will do. Or you could like it, th there's a really a lot of ways to to figure out which disk. Like you could even say like bypass, for example, like dev SDA or like. But the the, the path is a bit tricky because um, it's it might change like and you're never really sure that that's the correct one so we really recommend using other things like the wwn for example and a final question from peter peter's got a lot of questions he's obviously interested in this can you provision hardware raid and other hardware configuration as part of this setup it depends um software raid is uh, out of the box supported but for hardware raid it it depends on which um which um let's say hardware you're running on like um some of them like if, if you're using well i'm not exactly completely sure of which which is uh really supported in this case but some of them have a raid configuration possibility some dell servers for sure i'm not sure if um ilo supports really this but um that can, is something we can dive in uh, to figure to figure out Awesome. Yeah, but right. it, it's, it is definitely possible in some of the cases. Everything's, everything's possible. It's, yeah. With a, little exactly. extra, with a little extra documentation. It sounds like something that, that needs a little documentation. So. Yeah. But, it, um, it's just that personally, yeah. I, I didn't um, have the need yet, yet to do any like kind of red uh, configuration. So I haven't dived into this, but it definitely is possible for some of the hardware. So let's go to demo time now then. Great. Cool. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Let me switch to my terminal then quickly. All right. Can you see the screen? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thanks. So um, we have done the recording um, for the for the demo. But maybe I will first actually show something else before we jump into the I forgot the actual demo. So in the Metal Cube um, 
project, we have created a, a special repository called Battlecube DevEnv that is basically responsible for, um, that contains a couple of scripts that you can use in order to test Metalcube. So using the Metalcube DevEnv, you can, for example, deploy um, cluster API provider Metalcube, you can deploy bare metal operator, you can create a couple of virtual machines or delivered virtual machines and manage them as if they were your real bare metal servers. So the reason that we're using virtual machines is the first, we cannot always provide bare metal servers for testing and it gets very, very complicated. Uh, but thankfully, we have some uh, kind of tools that allows us to really, really replicate the real world scenario with real world scenario with the with the virtual machines. So, for example, instead of using the BMC like you would use uh, in real bare metal servers, we're using virtual BMC uh, that will basically talk to the management of your uh, libert virtual machines. So, um, so, what happens? What will happen during the demonstration is that we're gonna clone uh, the Metalcube event repository, uh, go into the path, and then run the make. So uh, in the place where we're running the make, um, so it's gonna first install the cluster for us, um, and then inside the cluster, it's gonna install a couple of components like the cluster API, which I uh, already talked, like which is a high level, um, that the, the core uh, project, let's say, and then we're gonna install, it's gonna install the cluster API provider Metalcube and then the bare metal operator for us. So uh, all those components are running inside the this cluster and let's call this cluster as a source, but it's also known as FML or the bootstrap cluster. So once the, uh, all these components are up and running, uh, the scripts will create a couple of virtual machines for us, or a libert virtual machines, and then it's gonna, um, uh, join, uh, it's gonna create the bare metal host objects reconciled by the bare metal operator and those bare metal host objects will represent the virtual machines that we have created. Um, and then uh, once we have the, the virtual machines that are referenced by a particular bare metal host, we're gonna start the provisioning of the, of the, uh, the bare metal hosts. So the provisioning, like we're gonna install some operating system into them, uh, then inject some SSH keys and then go into the inside the VM and see if the cluster is running and if the if the uh, if the bare metal um, host or in our case libre virtual machine is part of the target cluster. So, but once the the operating system is installed or the, the uh, provisioning is done, um, the scripts will try to create a target cluster for us and then join those uh, bare metal hosts or the nodes into the target cluster. So in that case, we have two cluster, one source, and then the second is the target. Uh, and then the target is basically running on the bare metal environment, but in our case, it's an emulated environment, so we will be running on the bare metal, uh, uh, on the virtual machines or delivered machines. And once you have cluster up and running with those nodes, you can do any kubectl operation, crude operation, create, delete, update, whatever, uh, on the BMH object, which is the uh, uh, short name for the bare metal host, or you can do any operation on the top level object, which is the machine coming from the cluster API object. All right, now I'm gonna switch to my terminal and start playing the, the recording we have done for you. All right, so, So what happens first is that I have already cloned the Metalcube DevEnv uh, in this environment and now I'm exporting a couple of environment variables before I run the make. So for example here, I'm specifying the container runtime uh, to be used. Uh, in the Metalcube DevEnv, you can use different container runtimes. Uh, uh, for example, you can use Docker or the Podman. And then here I'm specifying the target uh, OS that will be uh, provisioned, that will be used to provision the target node. So I'm specifying the Ubuntu, of course, I'm not telling which version of the Ubuntu because we have uh, made it in the script that you just specify the version and it will just pick the right one for you. Um, and then we have the another environment variable called ephemeral cluster, which specifies what tool do you want to use in order to spin up the source cluster. So we support currently the kind and the minikube to spin up the source cluster. And then the, sec the, uh, the next <clears throat> variable is the uh, CAPM3 version, which is the cluster API provider Metalcube version. We have different versions of the CAPM3. So in this case, we're using the latest one, Vivan Alpha 4. 
and then the number of the nodes which represents the number of the virtual machines or delivered machines that you want to create in your environment right so once we have exported we start running the make um, and then this process will gonna <clears throat> will take a couple of minutes um, it's it's gonna actually take a lot of time so we have done the magic with the video of course so once the the script has finished it um, to run uh, and then we're gonna run the uh, one of the script called verify.sh which will basically do the some checkup uh, in order to make sure that we have created uh, desired number of the virtual machines that we have created the uh, desired uh, replicas of the bare metal host um, and then we have all the networking set up properly and all these kind of checkups basically and then at the end you can see that we have a couple of um, some containers up and running uh, as a docker containers uh, these are mostly uh, used to do the management of your actual invert uh, machines so you can see that all the checks have passed um, and now now here we can see uh, a couple of things first we can see that uh, we have four uh, levered virtual machines in a powered off state uh, at the same time we have four uh, ironic nodes that represents uh, that are referenced by those virtual machines but in real case it would be your bare metal server for example and then at the same time here in the last you can see that we have four uh, bare metal host objects uh, node 0 node 1 node 2 and node 3 in the ready state so ready state man, means it's ready to be provisioned it has no operating system uh, so you can start actually provisioning but uh, introspection is already done for it uh, and it it's also registered it in, in 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 your um, in, it's also registered for the bare metal operator right um, the manageable is also from the ironic perspective that means that you can like start provisioning uh, the those ironic nodes so um, then we in the in the same environment we have a couple of scripts um, that we use to provision the bare metal uh, bare metal hosts so you can see here we have cluster uh, script we have control plane and then we have worker script so we first start executing the clusters uh, sh which will basically create the cluster object and apply into the cluster uh, and then it will create also a metal cube cluster object which is metal cube specific then the control plane dota sage will create um, one machine object and then metal cube machine object and then the bare metal host object so it's kind of linked and then at the same time it will create another uh, when you run the work it will create the same chain basically machine then metal cube machine and then the bare metal host so we will have in this environment for now two bare metal hosts two metal cube machines or two machines or two livered machines <laughs> Uh, virtual machines that we will use in our cluster so one of the machines will represent the kubernetes control plane node and the second one represent will represent um, the kubernetes working node let's say so uh, i'm going to skip how i run the scripts so basically i have run the scripts here <clears throat> and after some time you can see that <clears throat> provisioning has started so uh, provisioning does not start in parallel it will start uh, it will do the provisioning one by one so you can see one of the provision one of the nodes has started provisioning and it's started with control plane uh, of course and then <clears throat> the 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 virtual machine or the levered machine that represents that uh, bare metal host star, uh, is up and running and then you can see from the ironics perspective that uh, that node is in clean waste state meaning that it's actually right now doing the <clears throat> cleaning as my uh, earlier mentioned it, and it basically wipes out uh, all the disks that are available on that uh, levered virtual machines or virtual machine sorry all right so it's gonna all this process also will take some time <clears throat> and after a while uh, we should be able to see that two of the uh, bare metal hosts are now in provision state <clears throat> and then uh, you can see that two of the uh, levered virtual machines up and running and two of the ironic nodes are in active state so uh, also you can see the consumer for the bare metal host object you can see the consumer which represents the uh, the metal cube machine uh, that is consuming this particular uh, machine uh, bare metal host object all right um, and then also you can see the online field uh, the online field is set to true for both of these uh, bare metal hosts that represents that they are uh, powered on right now cool So the next step uh, that we're going to do is that see the chain of the object references. 
So we mentioned a couple of times that we have cluster objects, some objects from coming from the cluster API, some objects are coming from the metal cube, and then they are referenced by each other. So uh, the first object, the core object coming from the cluster API is the cluster. Uh, you can see that it's in provision state. And then we have infrastructure specific uh, cluster object that is referenced by this uh, top level cluster object. So in our case, in the metal cube, it's a metal cube cluster. So you can see that name is test one and it's basically referenced by this cluster object. Then we have the machines object uh, also from the cluster API. So we have two cluster API machines and we have two cluster API provider metal cube machines that are referenced by these machines. Um, and then at the same time, we have two other different objects from the cluster API. One is the machine deployment and then the second is the key CP. So machine deployment is like uh, basically like a deployment in the, for the pods. So it basically, you can use this object to manage uh, your machines. Uh, and then you have the key CP, uh, which is kind of the similar to machine deployment, but it's specifically meant for the control plane nodes. So that's why you can see that we have, for the control plane node, we have one replica, and for the workers, we have one replica. So in total, they represent two, two machines here. Great. So the next step, what we're going to do is that, if you remember, I have, uh, in this environment, we have created uh, four virtual machines. So the next step would be, we will try to basically scale up those uh, machine deployments and see if the uh, if the, uh, metal cube machines and the bare metal host uh, gets created and then starts provisioning. Uh, but before that, uh, I would also like to show you that now we have two bare metal hosts uh, provisioned. They are part of the target cluster. One of them is the control plane and the second one is the, the worker. So, and then we can see, we have the cube config for the target cluster. And here you can see that kubectl get pods with the target cube config shows you that you have this uh, basically uh, Kubernetes uh, pods up and running in your target cluster, right? And then if we also check the nodes for the target cluster, we should see two two Kubernetes nodes uh, running for the target cluster basically represents our two Libert virtual machines. So one thing to notice here, the status, as you see, it's uh, in not ready state, and that's because we haven't installed yet uh, the CNI uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the target cluster. For example, usually what we do is that we install the Calico, but in our case, we didn't do it. But if you install the Calico in the target cluster, and you do the proper networking, then you should see that the uh, status of the nodes uh, in, in, in ready state. So, and then the last check is that <clears throat> if we do kubectl get machines from the source cluster, we can see that we have two machines with the exact same name as the Kubernetes node for the target cluster. And that's because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're creating two machines that represent, uh, at the end of the day, represent two uh, uh, Kubernetes nodes. Okay. This is the first part. Now we're gonna play a bit with machine deployment um, and try to scale it. So currently we have uh, one replica of the machine deployment. So we have one worker node, and then we will try to increase the replicas to three because we have two other uh, levered virtual machines uh, that are free and then we can utilize them. So first uh, we're gonna try to increase the replicas here the three. So you can see that it says it's scaled now. And then if we check the status of all the corresponding objects, so first we can see that machine deployment is now scaling up and then it's trying to have two, uh, three replicas of the, uh, of the machines. And then you can see that here we have Machines being created, in, they are in the provisioning state, but they are uh, they don't have the provider ID yet, so they are not yet consumed. So, and then um, we have metal cube machines that are <clears throat> at the same time created by by the cluster API machines, two of them, uh, and they are also used in the same cluster test one. And then you can see that for now, uh, two virtual machines are still in powered off mode. Um, so this process also provisioning, as I said, it takes a lot of time. So after some time, we should be able to see all uh, two new uh, bare metal hosts in provision state and two levered virtual machines up and running as part of your Kubernetes cluster. So you can see that now they are 
uh, up and running. So the machines are running, and then the uh, metal cube machines they are also ready, and and they are basically and then other two virtual machines are also up and running. And we can also see the ironic node status. So you have two more uh, you have two more ironic nodes that are in the the active state and two other bare metal host objects in provision state. And you can see who is consuming this bare metal host here. And then all of them are online set to true because they are all powered on right now. If we check again Kubernetes nodes, we can see four nodes right now in our target cluster. So two new that we just uh, added in our, in our cluster. So that is basically end of the um, demonstration. And now I will switch over to the slides. Great. So that was the end of the demonstration. Um, so now, um, how do you contribute to MetalCube? So first of all, we really welcome very much and quite a lot any contribution that anyone is doing to the MetalCube. Uh, as I said, MetalCube is kind of uh, is a young project, and but we're growing really fast, and we have a lot of contribution from from different companies. Uh, uh, as I as, as was listed in the previous uh, in the previous slides, uh, so the the contribution that you are doing it can be basically anything. So you can do any documentations uh, uh, contribution. You can have some requests for the new feature. You might have some found some bugs and you might have to fix them if you want to, or you can report by the issues. Uh, you can participate in helping uh, creating the talks or presentations like this or the writing some blog posts we have in the metalcube.io website. We have a lot of <clears throat> blog posts that different people just write about the features uh, in the, from the Metalcube, trying to share the knowledge basically from the, with the community and uh, outside of the community. And then any questions that the, even the feedbacks that you might have uh, for the Metalcube is really, really appreciated. So we really love and we would really appreciate have some contribution from your side. So, and then also about the community, I mentioned the community. So we have the MetalCube community. Um, it's quite diverse. Uh, as I said, we have different contributions in different time zones. So the the the, the GitHub page is the metalcube.io. Uh, metalcube so we have contributors from currently AT&T, Dale, uh, Ericsson, Fujitsu, Mirantis, and then the Red Hat. So if you want to reach out the community members or ask any questions or chat with the community members or the contributors, you can join the, the Metal Cubes or the Cluster API bare metal on the Kubernetes Slack channel. Or if you have some questions, you can also reach out the, the maintainers through the CNCF mailing list. Or you can reach out the communities through the Metal Cubes own uh, mailing list. Uh, and also you can watch some updates and then new features being added through the Twitter. Um, so we have the community meetings that happens every alternate Wednesday um, at uh, 1 p.m. UTC time. Um, it happens on the Zoom. Uh, you can find the link here. And then we also have the recordings and different kind of uh, demos on the MetalCube YouTube channel that represents um, different features of the MetalCube and then some discussion that we have during the community meetings that you might be interested in. And that is the last uh, slide for our presentation today. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope it was interesting and somehow informative for you. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. So yeah, no, thank you very much, Mal and and um, Farouz for for joining <clears throat> us today. Um, a couple of things pop into my mind. I know um, a lot of the people who are watching this um, are probably OpenShift users, so they're. I believe there's a set of instructions, and if somebody, Peter, maybe you um, can pull up the set of instructions. There's a, a different, a slightly different deployment approach when we do it. Use Metal Cube, I think, the bare metal deployment on there. So just not to confuse the two, we are using Metal Cube um, for the OpenShift provisioning of um, bare metal, but there's a whole set of documentation on how to do it using OpenShift. So. Um, and that's the beauty of open source. Um, so it gets used um, by lots of people in lots of different ways and we all get to collaborate on it. So this is, 
I think it's pretty amazing. It's, it's wonderful that you're in the CNCF sandbox. I know that was um, a recent um, event. Uh, uh, well, was that a couple months ago? I don't know exactly. Yes. Yeah, a couple months ago. And it's a pretty healthy community that you have around, um, around Metal 3 already. I think it, was, it, filled, it definitely filled a gap in the pantheon of uh, the CNCF landscape, which is amazing to think that there was a gap because there's so much stuff in that landscape diagram. But um, bare metal was one of those things that um, really wasn't being addressed very well. So I think this is a perfect fit for, um, for the um, CNCF uh, sandbox and hopefully incubation sometime in not too distant future. Can you tell us a little bit, um, I guess, um, and let me see if in the chat if anyone else has questions besides me. Um, Peter was saying, BMC is also used with OCP, but it bootstraps all the typical OCP installation process. Yeah, that's definitely, there's a slightly different deployment method, methodology for when you're using this on um, OpenShift. So definitely read the OpenShift bare metal docs um, if you're watching this. And if you're watching this from anywhere else, doing it anywhere else, that's, you know, read the stuff that's on the um, metal3.io website. Um, and contribute your feedback to that, that website too. I think that's the beauty of this project and a lot of other projects at the CNCF is that um, they may get put out there by Red Hat initially or something, but then they get adopted by Ericsson and AT&T and Mirantis and um, everybody's collaborating on it. Can you talk a little bit first um, about, about um, the use case at Ericsson? You know, what made it um, so important for Ericsson to get involved in this project and to, to move, help move it forward? Because you guys, two of you maintainers on the project, obviously Ericsson's got a big commitment to using this. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and how you got permission to participate so actively in the project? Yeah, I can take the question. If, uh... So um, yeah, we ha we actually have quite a big commitment. Indeed, like it's ten people working full time on the on the Metal Cube project on the Ericsson side, and the reason for that is that um, Ericsson has its own um, Kubernetes distribution called CCD, and um, so there was a request for the bare metal um, for bare metal support, and so we were looking around and found that that cluster API had actually like a very interesting ID that we wanted to to take in. So we were looking for like a provider for like bare metal. And at that exact point, um, the metal cube project popped up from like Red Hat to get started that at the this exact time. It took us a bit of time to get on board because um, internally we have a lot of NDAs and stuff like this that prevent any kind of open source contribution. So um, there's actually a second entity that was created uh, just for um, open source contribution. So people had to move uh, companies to, to be able to, to, to do the, the open source. But then we actually like really got on board and started like contributing as much as we could to. And, and now um, MetalCube is really used as part of the uh, like core of the bare metal solution for Ericsson's Kubernetes distribution. So there are a couple other questions here you, um, that are popping in that are more related directly to the project. Um, one is asking, what are the prereqs before you start the installation, like DNS, network availability, BMC configurations, et cetera? And it seems you have to know MAC addresses and other details about the physical hardware you're provisioning on. Is that true? Yeah. Well, um, I want to take... Sure. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Um, Go ahead. The, there's a couple of things you need to have done um, before you can start any any deployment. Is of course the networking like that needs to be in place, um, like on the physical level, but also on like the configuration of the switches and everything. Um, you also so then that's at that point you should know already the MAC address of the interface that boots over PXE, um, uh, or, like to to be able to register the ironic node properly. Um, you don't need to know too much more about the the hardware. Maybe some details about the hard drive if you want to select one specifically for the for the installation. Um, the the and with regard to the BMC, um, it needs obviously to be configured and reachable um, 
So Ironic needs to be able to reach to reach it. So meaning that the node where the Ironic uh, pod runs in the cluster needs to have access um, through routing or direct connectivity, it doesn't matter, um, to the to the actual BMC. And then you store the credentials for that specific node's BMC in the in the secret uh, for the bare metal host. So yeah, there's a bit of work to be done beforehand. Like you need to have your BMC configured and the credentials there. You need to have the networking done. Uh, but once it's kind of like an initial setup. And once that is done, then you can deploy uh, whatever you need on top. I hope that answers the question. I think it did. Um, and definitely, I, th these have been great questions, Peter. So so thanks, because there really are some, you know. A lot of people are trying out this project for the for the first time, um, and I know one of your colleagues um, or, or on the project, Himesh, is working on um, doing a de demo of deploying uh, Metal Cubed on OKD4. So he's coming to the OKD working group in not too distant future, hopefully to demo that as well. So there's lots of um, lots. There's still lots to do in this project. Um, it's, you can use it in production, obviously you guys are, and that's that, but there's still lots of places where you can contribute and give back, um, and people are really looking for feedback on this project, so if you're testing it, deploying it anywhere, whether it's OKD or who knows where, um, then definitely um, give some feedback to the metal3.io group. I know you guys also have a webinar coming up, um, the CNCF webinar, Mal, I think, or and maybe Farouz is gonna help you, back you up on that one too, but that's in sometime in December, but there's lots of opportunities. If you can throw back up your slide with your final resources, because I think that's probably a really great place to end this one today, um, so that people know how to get a hold of you all. and. Um, and participate in those community meetings. And I hope um, we'll see you in the incubation channel sometime, not too soon. I know you just jumped out into the sandbox, so it may take a little bit more doing, but um, it's definitely something. And um, I'm betting that you guys might have a few talks at KubeCon coming up. You get any? We don't have talks per se, but we have office hour now. Like because yes. we now have our uh, sandbox project, we got the benefit of being able to schedule a couple of office hours during KubeCon. So we're gonna have two. Um, one of them is in the 17th of December, and the other one is on the 20th, I think. But I don't recall the hours with the time zone. It's anyway such a mess. <laughs> Wouldn't yeah, be I able think, to I think it right it's now. The 17th of November, probably. November, sorry, yes, yeah. <laughs> obviously. <Don't worry. laughs> is far, far, far away. A KubeCon is coming much faster than that. Um, it's like a freight train coming right at us. So definitely um, look for those office hours because um, that's on the 17th. That's coming up soon. There's a couple of um, community meetings. I think there's at least one community meeting before that as well on your schedule if I looked right. Um, yes, and next week. Next yeah. week, yep. So there's lots of places where you can participate. Um, and if you are an OpenShift user, um, do check the um, documentation um, on OpenShift um, for the bare metal deployment because it is a slight variation on this um, and you'll probably need some more details. But this is um, a great way to, to showcase um, how someone like Ericsson um, and is putting huge effort into um, stepping up and contributing back and collaborating with lots of other people to make something um, wonderful that we all get to you know get to use and take advantage of and hopefully contribute back to so Farouz and Mal thanks for taking the time today um, we really appreciate this and um, keep us posted we'll have you back um, when you get your next release um, and you can tell us about all the new features and look for a demo by Himesh around um, deploying OKD4 on bare metal using uh, Metal 3. I think that's um, one of his channel challenges of the month to do. So, um, and there's also a great blog post, uh, series of blog posts on the Metal 3. Uh, .io um, website too to check out. So, if you have a use case for this um, and you're looking for some place to um, land and have a conversation about it, definitely reach out and join this crowd. So, thanks again, everybody, and. Um, have a wonderful week. It's only Monday. Thank you very much.